you remain standing and turn with me in your Bible, Luke chapter 6 and verse 6. Boy, it's nice in here. Y'all, isn't it good to just be with each other and in his presence? Luke 6, 6, I'm reading from the New King James Version. I'm in a series of sermons called The God of Great Reversals. And it's a series of sermons here from the Gospel of Luke. We're now in Luke chapter 6 and verse 6. We find these words recorded in the New King James Version. Now it happened on another Sabbath also that he entered the synagogue and taught. And a man was there whose right hand was withered. So the scribes and Pharisees watched him closely whether he would heal on the Sabbath that they might find an accusation against him. But he knew their thoughts. Said to the man who had the withered hand, arise and stand here. And he arose and stood. And then Jesus said to them, I will ask you one thing. Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil? to save life or to destroy. And when he had looked around at them all, he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he did so, and his hand was restored as whole as the other. But they were filled with rage and disgust with one another what they might do to Jesus. Amen. You can have your seat in the presence of the Lord today. I'm Y'all shouted the first 12 minutes of my preaching time. I want to I wanna tag this text and with the help of the Lord, preach from the subject paralysis in the pew. Paralysis in the pew. In our text today is a man with a crippling condition. This man is at church in the synagogue, according to the text, every Sabbath day. It'd be the equivalent for us to say that he's at word every Sunday. I want you to hear this. He is withered in worship. He, he is in church, but struggling. He, He's in church, but he is conflicted in his own being. He's not at church winning. He's at church still struggling. Even before I unpack this text, I want to park here for just a moment. Say to all of us that not everybody that shows up on Sunday morning has it all together. If the truth were to be told, many of us come here withered. The only difference between this man and some of us is that his withering is visible. He has a hand that he is incapable of stretching out. It's his right hand. But the reality of it is the person sitting next to you may look fine. The issue is I don't see the withering of their heart. I don't see the withering of their head. I don't see the withering. We don't always know what people are struggling with. That's why we have to be careful when we come up here thinking everybody's on the same page, everybody's good, everybody has all their needs met. Some of us have come up in here barely holding on. If I had a handful of people in this room or on our East City campus, you would testify right now that when I show up at church on Sunday, it's not always because I have checked every box and everything. It's not always good with me and my spouse. I'm not always happy about what's going on in my life, but I keep showing up anyway. This is a man who has, it's in the check, uh, test, chapter 6, verse 6, and it happened on another Sabbath. Everybody say another Sabbath. Uh, on, on another Sabbath is suggesting to us that he has been there on other Sabbaths. It's not just a statement of Jesus preaching and teaching on another Sabbath. No, 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 no. The, the, the subject verb agreement says that not only is Jesus there another Sabbath, but the crippled man is also there with him another Sabbath. Which means he's had repeated Sabbaths of hearing Jesus preach, hearing Jesus proclaim things about faith and about grace and about forgiveness. And yet here he is still withering. And y'all, as I preach today, this is the purpose. There are many of us, I'm probably in this list, that maybe I don't have a withered hand. But sometimes I wind up with a withered hope. 
All you got to do is keep listening to media. And re- the, the good thing about the tension of our nation, there's a good thing. The good thing about the tension of nation is that, is that you can't make it without the Lord in this season. See, in this season, you need somebody bigger than you. In this season, you need somebody stronger than you. In this season, you need somebody wiser than you. I can't make this thing on my own. The blessing of it is every once in a while, I read something, I see something, and my hope is withered. Some of us have come with withered homes. You're here, but your spouse is not because y'all not making it right now. With withered homes where you've been faithful to your children to try to teach them in the fear and admonition of the Lord, and yet they wind up straying. Where are my people? Where whether or not it's a withered hand or a withered hope or a withered home, some of us have had withered hearts. Trusted somebody. Trusted my heart with them. Trusted what was going on in my life. I wish I had honest people in here that... That, that sometimes the withering of my life is because I've, I've trusted other people with my emotions and how I was feeling and what was going on in my life only for them to betray the confidence I put in them. But I got good news for people with withered homes and, and with withered hearts and with withered hosts. Some of us have come with withered health. Just like that. The news can come in just like that. The results of the blood test just like that. The oncologist calls just like that. And I'm here today to preach to withered situations, people that are in the pews, in the seats. But there's an element of paralysis. This is a man who is not able to do anything with his right hand. Not very different than us who won't do anything with our right hand. Some of y'all missed that. Um, 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 one of my favorite quotes Uh, is that there's fundamentally no difference between the man who can't read and the man who won't read. I would argue today that there's fundamentally no difference between the person who can't move and the one who won't move. Because what difference does it make for me to have all of my faculties and my facilities and God blessing me with hands that will move and feet that will move and I make up in my mind that I won't. So today, I want to leave three very, very simple thoughts with you. I won't preach long at all. I hope this will be life-giving to someone. Uh, The the first thing that I want to lift up, that when I get to the church, when I get in the pew, and there's an element of paralysis, there's a moment where I either won't move or can't move. There's a moment where I really won't engage or I can't engage. There's a moment where my heart is heavy, my home is struggling, my health is not good. How is it that this man responds? The first thing this man does in responding is he teaches us that I must feed on the word of God. Uh, 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 Chapter 6, verse 6, he says, it happened on another Sabbath also that he entered the synagogue, everybody say, and taught. Uh, In in other words, y'all, he is familiar with two things. He's acquainted with two things that all of us must be acquainted with. Watch it. It's in the text. He shows up on the Sabbath again, and Jesus got up to teach. Let me say it one more time for my slow learners in the back. He came to the temple, and then he showed up to teach. Here are the two things that we must be acquainted with. We must be acquainted with the temple of God, and we must be acquainted with the teachings of God. I I challenge our first service that that you need to get familiar with your own worship center. Those of you who are first time visitors, you've gotten over the scariest part. The scariest part of ever coming to any church is walking in it the first time. You don't know where the bathrooms are. You don't know where to park. You don't know how people are going to treat you. But the moment you get here and you start dealing with some of the things you were struggling with, you start recognizing that I've already passed the first hurdle, which is just to get acquainted with the temple of God. And the man is not acquainted with the temple of God while everything is good in his life. He is acquainted with the temple of God while he is struggling. I want to park here and say to the whole room, y'all, don't just show up when everything is good. And you can brag about how much money is in your pocket. You can brag about how healthy you are. No, show up when you are withered. Show up when you are struggling. Show up when you are depressed. The same God that is worthy of my praise when things are good is also worthy of, come on, Job, testify. The same God that God gives and the Lord takes away still bless his name. The text says he shows up on another Sabbath. 
This is a man who has a withered hand, and I need y'all to get this. It's going to get a little tight, but I hope y'all can handle it. He would not have gotten his healing had he not shown up in the tabernacle. Now, I know we live in a culture, we probably have more people right now on our East City campus than we have right now, but the equivalent of East City campus worship is, is that you don't watch us next week when it's convenient. That you ought to be watching us in real time right now. That's your equivalency of showing up. And so what he's saying, y'all, and I want somebody to get this, I never know the Sunday that the Lord is going to show up and speak specifically to the issue that I have going on in my life. I'm sorry, can I just say this? For, have you ever been at that moment where you really didn't feel like coming a particular Sunday, but you pressed your way through anyway? You weren't in the best attitude. You weren't be in the best head space. You didn't really feel like faking it with everybody and smiling at them and acting like everything was good. You didn't really want to deal with the rain outside, but you made up in your mind, you know what? I'm still going to get up and show up in the house of God. And you got in here and you walked down the aisle and you flopped down in your seat. And before you know it, the Lord was speaking about your house he was speaking about your marriage he was raising up a healing and a deliverance for what you were going see you never know the Sunday the Lord is going to show up with the answer that you need for your situation one of my one of the questions I don't like being asked as a pastor is pastor can you go to heaven and not go to church I have a question back for you why would you want to go to heaven if you don't want to go to church? It, it, it would be, what, 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 what soldier do you know without an army? Come on, what salesman do you know without a customer? What bee do you know without a hive? What author without a reader? What, what, what student without a school? And I know we live in a culture where we don't feel like showing up is that important. But the reality of it is God wants us to show up. And when we show up and we familiarize ourselves with the word of God, I'm here to tell you, the Lord will speak directly to your house, to your situation, to your struggle. I've got to first feed on his word. First thing this man does, he's withered. He's struggling, but he feeds on the word. Praise God. I, I love the music but I need a word. Where are my handful of people? I, I love the fellowship with the people, but tell your neighbor, but I need a word. Well, I, I, love, I love the ministry I serve in, but at the end of the day, the flowers will pass away, and what's all left is the word of the living God. Number, number one, number one, I gotta feed on the word. The second thing this man teaches us, the second thing he teaches us is that I have to focus on God's will. Um, the man shows up and the text says, this particular Sabbath, he gets the attention of Jesus. Let me say a few things about this. Don't worry about you not getting the attention of people. I fundamentally want to get the attention of Jesus. Now, 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 I need you to get this. The problem is Satan will always set up hindrances and roadblocks to keep me from getting the attention of Jesus. The, the text tells us what the roadblocks are. Because if we're not careful, y'all, can I speak to the demon of hindering spirits? This is, why, this is why we have to be so careful how we operate in church. Because what I don't want to be is a hindering spirit. I don't want to be passing a mint when the Lord is about to give somebody the word they need to get them out. Y'all not talking. I don't want to be walking through the back door and scooting over in the middle of the aisle when the Lord is speaking to what somebody needs to. So I gotta be careful that I'm not an agent of Satan. So the text says that there are some specific people that are, it's gonna get tight, that are 
religio political groups. Or if you rather, political religious groups that have existed from the beginning of the church that exist till now. Because every Herodian, Pharisee, and scribe is not dead. Bible says two of the political religious groups in the synagogue were the scribes and the Pharisees. If you were to study the Gospel of Mark, he would introduce us to the third one, which is the Herodians. Let me just teach for just a moment. Whenever you identify a passage of scripture in the New Testament in the Gospels, that is a story, a healing, a miracle, generally speaking, Luke has more of his unique ones than everyone else because he's a physician and he sees humanity and the human condition different than everyone else. But generally speaking, these stories are always also in what's referred to as the synoptic gospels. Technically, John is not a synoptic gospel. It's really Matthew, Mark, and Luke that are synoptic gospels. And, 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 and within these, when you study a particular story, when you find that same story in other gospels, when you put those three snapshots together, it gives you the full understanding of what the story is. Let me kill a demon. That does not mean the Bible is contradictory. Right now, as I preach, there are people, thousands of people on the East City campus. The temperature where, they're, uh, where they are is different than in here. The, they, they, they have camera angles that you don't see. So they are all witnessing the same service, but they are witnessing from a different position. So when they testify of what happened at service, they're going to give a different account of the same service, not because they're contradicting each other, but because their stories are from a different vantage point. Such as our Gospels. In this Gospel, we are told that there are three, two in this text, but Luke, uh, Mark gives us the third. There are two political, secular, political uh, religious groups that are watching the reaction and the relationship between Jesus and the withered man. They're watching. He walks down the aisle. Withered hand. Right hand. The Bible is not just the word of God, it's the words of God. Which means it's not just a hand, it's a reason he's telling us it's the right hand. Don't have time to unpack that right now, but the right hand, at his right hand are pleasures evermore. Whenever we see reference to God's right hand, it is the hand of his authority. It is the hand of his power. It is the hand of his strength. So when the Bible says he has a withered right hand, it's saying that he has no strength. He has no power. He has no authority. And, and so, so he walks in, withered hand. He sits in the pew. Paralysis in the pew. The scribes, Herodians, Pharisees, I'm talking to some of y'all, immediately look at Jesus to see if he's going to heal him on the Sabbath. First of all, let me say this. It's going to get a little tight in here, especially the Sunday before Election Day. Um, 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 first of all, when you come to church, I don't want you caring nothing about what people think about your condition. I, I say this with all love. There's not a person here with a heaven or hell to put any of us in. And at the end of the day, don't worry about what people are rumoring about you, saying about you, sneering about you, snickering about you, gossiping about you. At the end of the match, it don't matter one bit because the truth be told, you probably have a few of your family members that don't even want to see you deliver it because they like the fact that you got to come to them for a handout and you got to look less than what they do. But I'm here to speak life to every withered situation. And if you've got a withering, don't worry about what people say. Jesus is present to deliver. These scribes begin looking at Jesus. I got to hurry. I got to hurry. They start looking at Jesus. Let me, let me help y'all. 
Oh God, help me, Holy Ghost. I didn't know I was going to be here the Sunday before election day, but here I am. Uh, 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 um, see, the scribes were the lawyers of the day. Uh, the scribes were the ran ones that run Secretary of State. Um, the scribes are the ones that they develop the law in great detail. Uh, the, 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 the scribes are the one, we will refer to them as, as, as rabbi. Uh, the scribes, y'all don't think they're still alive, huh? Uh, let, me tell you, let me tell you how I know they're still alive. The scribes believe the law can save you. The, 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 the scribes believe that, 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 that if you follow every element of the rule of law, no grace, no justice, no equity, I'm going somewhere. You, you, you can tell a scribe when they use the law to keep people crooked, crippled. Y'all not talking. You, you, you can tell a scribe when, 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 when they don't see the law for crippled people. First, first, first group, scribe looking at him, I, you bet, you bet, you bet not heal him. How dare you give him the opportunity we have. Y'all, y'all not talking, but that's all right. I'm gonna keep preaching. Uh, um, um, the Pharisees. Now, th this group to me is the worst group. The Pharisees are the Jewish separatists and extremists. The Pharisees are Jewish nationalism. The, the Pharisees are far right. If it was, I ain't scared of y'all, I'm gonna preach. Uh, if this was 2025, this would be MAGA Jews. They look at Jesus. You bet not. Make him good enough that he then gets to be where we are. I like looking down on him. I like him being less than. I like being able to categorize him. You better not make him look like us. Because if you heal him, then I got to let him in my country club. So, so, you got the scribes, if it were today, they probably would be the authors of Project 2025. You have the Pharisees, who are the Jewish extremists and separatists. They gain their power not by unifying, but by dividing. Y'all not talking. They, they get their power by looking up for people that are not Jews. They look down on people with different races, different creeds, different religions. They, they get their angle by separating people and not unifying people. And then if you look at Mark's gospel, it's the Herodians. Uh, the Herodians were the materialists. Uh, the, 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 uh, um, 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 Elon Musk would be a Herodian. The, 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 this is the political religious group that, that, that says, look, I don't care if folk have clean water or not, just don't tax me so much. That the, that the whole being of my life is about how much I make and what I have and what I've accomplished. And so you now have, watch this, the three groups that claim parity with Jesus are really proving that they are antithetical to Jesus. Yeah. 
They look. I love this. They look at Jesus. Jesus looking at them. The same way he's looking at materialists and separatists and dividers and moral legalists saying that does not look like me. He looks at them and he looks at the man with the crippled hand. He says, get up. Strange, I'm almost done. Strange command because his leg is not crippled. Why not just speak to the hand while he's seated? Jesus says, Jesus says, yo, get up, stand here. See, I think sometimes before God blesses you, he wants your enemies to get a good look. And he, he says, stand right here. I'm, I'm done. He says, stand right here. I, I said, Lord, why would you ask him to stand? Wouldn't that be embarrassing? Now the whole church, the whole temple sees his where he's afflicted. Can I tell you what the Lord said in my spirit, my private time? The Lord said, son, the reason why I had him to stand is because before I heal you, you have to acknowledge your need of needing a healing. And see, I believe there's some of us in church, whether we're in this room or on the East City campus, that the reason the Lord has not shown up is because you act like you got it all on your own. You have to be willing to stand up before the Lord and say, God, it is me. I am broke. I am struggling. I don't know which way to hold up my head. I need to God. I need to show him everything that's bleeding, everything that's falling apart. And when we show up and show him what I need, he says, stand up. Stop acting like you're not broken. Stop acting like you have it going on. Stop acting like you're so happy. Stand up. Stop acting like things are perfect in your life. Stand up in front of everybody with tears in your eyes, with a shout in your mouth, with a frustration on your voice. He says, stand up. Cripple man. In front of the religious separatists, in front of the extremists, in front of the materialists, in front of the no choice legalists. The difference now is I'm not standing by myself in front of the three of y'all, I'm standing next to Jesus. And Jesus says, stand up, watch this. And he says, stretch out your hand. He stretches out his hand and the hand immediately start looking like the other hand. And I don't know who I'm preaching to. God is still able to make us stand up, stretch out, and get delivered. Stand up, stretch out, and be set free. Stand up and stretch out and made a whole life new. I'm done, I'm done. Let me close my Bible. I'm seven minutes, 59 seconds over. Here we go. He said, stand up, stretch out. I know some of y'all thinking, come on, just, I want, just take, your, take your right hand. Got to be your right hand, not your left hand, right hand. And I want you just to turn it up like you're with it a little bit. Now, I know what you're thinking. I'm so glad I'm not like this. But let me tell you, let me tell you what it means for my life in 2025, 2024. Here it is, watch this. The reason his hand won't stretch out is because inactivity has shrunken the muscle. Some of you, you may not look like you shriveled up, but when you are not active, the muscle that God gives you begins to get shorter and construct, constrict. When my mother, before she went on to be with the Lord, she would sit and watch TV most of the days. And, and she was sitting in her favorite spot and she had these stress balls. And, and y'all you know my mama was white, right? So this is gonna make you laugh. Um, she loved watching BET. <laughs> she watched BET all day. I, I said, mom, what you watching? She said, I'm watching BET television. <laughs> I said, mom, what's BET? I said, mom, that's black entertainment, it's BET. She sit there and she watch Tyler Perry, all that stuff, and she squeeze them stress balls 
all day long. I come home, mama, why are you squeezing the stress balls? She said, because I'm not working no more. And, and I don't want my fingers to get tight with arthritis. So I want to keep them moving. I don't know who I'm preaching to. But God is trying to stretch you out because you haven't been moving in a long time. And it's time to get moving in the kingdom and to get moving and serving people and get moving and praying for people and get moving and worship him and get moving and do for people. God wants us not to get tight. But to be able to stretch out. I'm done. I'm done. So he says to the man, stand up. Stretch out your hand. And the Bible says his hand was restored just like the left hand. And then the haters might as well preach to them real quick. Uh, immediately tried to figure out I, I'm going to read it straight out the Bible. They ain't going to believe me. You're right. I'm, we, we, I'm, I'm, I'm extending this invitation. We're going to eat. We're getting out of here. I need you to get this. What I'm about to say is life transformative. If you get it, we're going to stop being scared of things and scared of people. And we're going to stop shirking back in our faith. I want you to understand what sent Jesus to the cross. Verse 11. They were filled with rage. Stop right there. Why were they filled with rage? Because he made someone's life as equal to theirs. They were filled with rage and discussed with one another what they might do to Jesus. I, I know we don't process it like this, but the Herodians and the Pharisees and the scribes, the separatists, the legalists, the extremists, what creates hate is when everyone has the same opportunities that they have. Yeah. 